Ten years ago, the Iraq war began. We were told it was necessary to get rid of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, WMD. The weapons of mass destruction program is not shut down. It is up and running now. Tony Blair assured us the intelligence was beyond doubt. In fact, it was anything but. What appeared to be gold in terms of intelligence turned out to be fool's gold. He has existing and active military plans for the use of chemical and biological weapons, which could be activated within 45 minutes. Did he say that he'd seen the weapons? No. The Iraqi regime has plotted to develop anthrax and nerve gas and nuclear weapons for over a decade. There was an atmosphere of, we've got to find something. Very bad intelligence got to the leadership very quickly. But very other intelligence just didn't make it. We can now show how much of the key intelligence was based on wishful thinking and lies. Why did he fabricate such a story? I think he wanted to find a new home. Faulty intelligence fabricated by spies like this man Press the button for war. And our guy called me on the secure phone. He said he's fabricated. I, I, he said, I believe this is all made up. The Iraq war was based on lies. The source was an eyewitness. He actually was present during biological agent production runs. Were you present mm -hmm. then? We have first-hand descriptions of biological weapons factories on wheels. There were no, no. mobile trucks. No. You were simply making it up. Tonight, we reveal how British and American intelligence got it so wrong. The fact is that we went to war in Iraq on a lie, and that lie was your lie. Yes. The spies who fool the world were telling Downing Street and the White House what they wanted to hear, that Saddam had WMD hidden away somewhere deep in the desert. But just six months before the invasion, there was one piece of intelligence that could have stopped the war. The story begins in Paris. The source was unique the closest Western intelligence had ever got to Saddam, a minister in his cabinet. French intelligence held the key. The key was a trusted intermediary who'd worked with the French before and who knew the minister well. The French decided to give the key to the head of the CIA station in Paris, Bill Murray. I was told that the source was considering leaving uh, Saddam Hussein's regime and trying to get out, and that he had a great deal of intelligence that he might wish to share. How highly placed was the source? He was one of the chief members of Saddam Hussein's cabinet. So he looked like a person of real interest, somebody we should really be talking to. French intelligence put Bill Murray in touch with the intermediary, an Arab journalist in Paris. What did the intermediary ask you for? A million dollars up front. The sum demanded was huge, but so too was the potential value of the source. He was Iraq's foreign minister, Naji Sabri. We shall defend our land, our people. I gave the intermediary up front a sum of money, I won't say exactly how much. Bill Murray gave the intermediary $200,000. In cash? In cash. Um, to be used to pay his expenses, to show that we were serious, and also to provide some personal items for the source. Did you personally hand over the cash to the intermediary? Yeah, yeah. In what, in a suitcase? Or in a Brown paper envelope? I don't remember, to tell you the truth. Probably, probably a pa paper bag. 
We finally track down the intermediary in Paris. We understand he denies receiving any money. His name is Nabil Mograbi. He wanted 10,000 euros for an interview. We said no. Bill Murray gave the intermediary questions for the Iraqi foreign minister. Top of the list was WMD. The intermediary met the minister in New York six months before the invasion and only a week before the British government published its dossier which made the case for war. Bill Murray received the answers to his questions and a secret sign was devised to show the source Naji Sabri was on board. The intermediary had had a couple of suits tailor-made for the source, one of which he wore when he gave a speech at the UN. That was part of the agreement to confirm the relationship between the intermediary and the source. So when you saw the source, the Saddam cabinet minister wearing his new suit, what did that tell that you? It was my new suit. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I hereby declare before you that Iraq is... It told me that, yes, they're telling me the truth. They really have had the meeting and, you know, they've passed the materials. The American officials have been fabricating... Murray couldn't stories. meet the minister, so the intermediary briefed him on what Saddam really had. The CIA insists the intelligence showed that Saddam had WMD programs. Murray says his report was used selectively. He had some chemical weapons left over from the early 90s. So he had taken the stocks and given them to various tribes that were loyal to him. He had intentions to have weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, and nuclear. But the report was very clear about what he actually had at that point in time, and he had virtually nothing. Were the British informed? All of the intelligence that we had was being passed to them. So I had to assume that they were, knew about it. We asked Naji Sabri for an interview, but he declined. In a statement, he said the entire story was totally fabricated. He confirmed he had met an Arab journalist in New York, but disputes the account of the meeting. The Bush administration simply dismissed this secret intelligence from Iraq's foreign minister on the grounds that he would say this, wouldn't he? They were not happy. I was told they were not happy. Why not? Uh, they just didn't believe it. Um, they, uh, I was told that the biological weapons information didn't square with the information from quote, our best source. It wasn't until later that I heard about the history of Curveball. Curveball, the code name of American intelligence's best source. This shadowy figure was to transform the intelligence on WMD, an Iraqi refugee with first-hand evidence that Iraq was producing deadly biological weapons. The story he would spin began at the Zerndorf refugee camp just outside Nuremberg, Germany. He arrived here at the end of December 1999, desperately seeking asylum as a refugee from Saddam's tyrannical rule. We finally managed to track him down in a small German town. His real name was Rafid al Janabi. In fear of his life, he disappeared from view seeking anonymity and security. My dream was, not only my dream, but the dream of many Iraqis, to see Saddam Hussein out of power in Iraq. al Janabi's details were placed on file at Zerndorf. But as his background aroused particular interest, he was interviewed by German intelligence. The man told me they've heard you are a chemical engineer and this concerns the asylum office and the German government. This is the first television interview that the head of German intelligence has ever given about Curveball. It was very difficult to get inside information at that time from uh, Iraq. It was very important for us to have uh, 
a human source uh, who has been engaged in this uh, program and therefore it was a very valuable uh, source. They didn't know whether this guy was a liar or he is telling the truth. And if he is telling the truth, then there is a serious problem. Years of UN inspections prove that Saddam had lied and concealed his lethal chemical and biological agents. They'd been manufactured in giant vats or fermenters like these. This agricultural seed factory is where Curveball said he'd worked. I worked at the site for about seven to eight months. This, at least, was true. Political asylum and money were on the horizon. He told his German interrogators with sketches that he'd been involved in developing mobile biological laboratories with fermenters mounted on trucks. They gave me an opportunity to say what I wanted. A lot of the information which was given to German intelligence was extremely detailed, and they verified this information. German intelligence gave the Americans over a hundred top-secret reports on Curveball's case. The Americans wanted to meet Curveball face to face and make their own assessment of his credibility. But the Germans steadfastly refused. He told us, I don't want to see the Americans. If he is not willing, really, to meet the American side or others, then we have to respect it. The Germans were telling us he doesn't like Americans, he doesn't speak English, he only speaks Arabic and German, uh, and he only wants to talk to Germans. But there was another reason. The Germans' concern the Americans might overplay Curveball's intelligence. We were in a delicate situation. We don't know what the Americans will do with the information. We can't control that any longer. So the decision was quite clear. Give them our level of information, um, and, uh, but not direct access. Towards the end of 2000, Curveball's story began to unravel when the Germans realized that Curveball had lied about some parts of his story. Satellite imagery confirmed these doubts. Photographs contradicted Curveball's description of the site where he'd worked near Baghdad. He said that large trucks with trailers had been driven in and out of the end warehouse but satellite images showed it would have been impossible for an articulated truck to make that maneuver. What's more, there was a six-foot wall in the way. Curveball's duplicity was well known to his former boss and close friend. Each had been to the other's wedding. We were together for a long time, I knew this guy is, is a congenital liar. A congenital liar. Why do you say he was a congenital liar? Because he's always making stories. He's a spy, he's a con man. He's caused a disaster for worldwide, not for Iraqis. After a year of interviews with Curveball, German intelligence decided to terminate their regular meetings with him. At the beginning of 2001, Curveball was out in the cold, flipping burgers at this fast food outlet near Nuremberg. But one seismic event was to change everything and place Curveball center stage once more. Nine Eleven gave President Bush the opportunity to achieve his long-term goal of overthrowing Saddam Hussein, erroneously associating him with Al-Qaeda. This is a regime that has something to hide from the civilized world. States like these 
and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. And what Curveball was saying now seemed too good to dismiss. To the White House, Curveball underpinned their case. But doubts were growing. In the spring of 2002, MI6 sent the CIA a cable summing up its position on Curveball. Elements of his behavior strike us as typical of individuals we would normally assess as fabricators. But nevertheless, it was inclined to believe that a significant part of Curveball's reporting is true. I believe there were doubts in MI6 about this case from the beginning. And there was a debate, as there was in our service, and I think they couldn't verify it. They didn't have any additional information. Kerbal is saying, I was first-hand witness to the production of the biological agents. I saw accidents where people died, and, and I saw you know, railroad cars full of stuff, and they saw the trucks. And he was very detailed, some of it quite detailed, and, you know, the types of pumps and valves. And the key point of this is that he was telling information that people wanted to hear. Despite all the reservations, both MI6 and the CIA decided to stick with Curveball. And they soon had what they thought was corroboration. An Iraqi major who defected confirmed that Iraq has mobile biological research laboratories. This was the second spy who fooled the world an Iraqi defector from Saddam's intelligence service who made his way to Jordan. His name was Major Mohammed Harith. He offered himself to an exile group known as the Iraqi National Congress, or INC. Major Mohammed Harith was uh, an Iraqi defector that the INC located in Jordan, Amman. Uh, he was quite desperate to get out of Jordan. Nabil Massawi was filmed by American television talking to Major Harith. Harith said it was his idea to develop mobile biological laboratories. He said he'd bought Renault Seven. trucks and revealed how many. Seven. But the Americans had doubts because his story was so elaborate and unbelievable. He even claimed he'd met Osama bin Laden. Major Harith was given a lie detector test. But, perhaps surprisingly, he passed. When he talked about the mobile unit, yeah, I did believe him, actually. Was his story true? Uh, it proven post-2003, no. Fabricated? Fabricated. So why did he there was There was no proof. Why did he fabricate such a story? I think he wanted to find a new home. In the end, neither the Pentagon nor the CIA was convinced. And in spring 2002, a burn notice was issued saying that Major Harith was a fabricator. The Americans realized that Major Mohammed Harith was making it all up. He was a fabricator. Yeah. Yet his intelligence was still Used. quoted. Yes. By Same with Kerbal. Inexplicably, as with Curveball, Major Harith's intelligence would remain on file, waiting to come back and bite. Now there was to be a third attempt to fool the world, based on the nightmare scenario that Saddam could be developing a nuclear weapon. Saddam Hussein is determined to get his hands on a nuclear bomb. Once again, the story starts with a tantalizing kernel of truth, this time in Rome. In 1999, a genuine secret letter came to light indicating that an Iraqi ambassador was planning to visit Niger, a country rich in uranium. But soon the fact turned to fantasy. The fantasy revolves around this man, Rocco Martino, who, over the years, had had dealings with the Italian and other intelligence agencies. 
In this surveillance picture, he's meeting an intelligence officer. He, he liked to, to be a charming man. He was very mysterious. Uh, and um, there was a, something uh, shadowy um, around him, a part of it. And, uh, this Rocco Martino gave Elisabetta Berber a set of documents, which she later gave to the American embassy. Potentially, they were the smoking gun that everybody in that time was looking for. It's a murky story. What is clear is that Rocco Martino got the documents from the embassy of Niger in Rome, and an Italian intelligence officer was involved at some stage. The sensational documents detailed how Iraq was planning to buy 500 tons of pure uranium from Niger and were signed and sealed by the president of Niger. The documents looked authentic and they even included the original genuine letter. But on a closer examination, they soon turned out to be a crude forgery. So they were filled with all kinds of mistakes and holes, and they used the name of a previous Minister of Foreign Affairs, a Minister of Foreign Affairs from a previous regime. The seals of the, of the Nigerian government were all hand-drawn. So it was a pretty bad forgery. Earlier on, Martino had tried to sell the documents to French intelligence, but they refused to take the bait. We were highly skeptical. We didn't even mention them to any friendly services. And most important of all, we didn't trace any acquisition uh, of uranium by Iraq during the whole period. French intelligence officers were twice dispatched to Niger's uranium mines to check it out. They reported there was nothing to it. Rochon likens the spread of the documents to a contagion. It was disseminated to some intelligence services, including France, Germany, UK. Then it crossed the Atlantic, and uh, in the end, uh, only the US and the UK uh, made that public. Because probably the immune system was weaker. The White House eagerly seized on the intelligence. Once again, it was exactly what they wanted to hear. The CIA had its reservations, but the Niger story just kept on turning up. My agency tried repeatedly to bang down that whole issue over and over and over again. But it just, one of my colleagues referred to it as whack-a-mole. You'd hit it over the head and it would go away and then it would pop back up again at another spot. We contacted Rocco Martino via his family, but they said he was too ill to do an interview or comment. He's always denied knowing the documents were forgeries. The exact role of Italian intelligence in this story is unclear, but they deny any involvement. The journalist who inadvertently fueled the circulation of the forgeries feels guilty. Personally, I feel uh, very bad because uh, I have been used uh, to justify a war which ended up uh, with uh, thousand or hundred of thousand of uh, deaths. MI6 stood by the Niger story, not based on the forged documents, but on British intelligence, including eavesdropping from here at GCHQ. The current British inquiry into the intelligence failings, chaired by Sir John Chilcott, is now into its fourth year. Behind its closed doors, one senior MI6 officer was distinctly underwhelmed by the intelligence on Niger. The Niger uranium thing was pretty unfortunate, really. If desk officers in the service had had their way, 
probably would never have seen the light of day. The late Brian Jones, who was head of the WMD section at Defence Intelligence, was equally dismissive. There was no suggestion in intelligence that Saddam was close to having a nuclear weapon. Although we knew that he, he'd sought nuclear weapons, there was never any suggestion that, that he had acquired them or indeed was, um, was very close to, to acquiring them. Saddam's alleged attempt to buy uranium from Niger remained on intelligence files in Washington and London, just like curveballs and major hariths. Now the spies who fool the world had sowed the seeds for the biggest intelligence failure in living memory. Politically, events were now moving fast. Eleven months before the war, Tony Blair met President Bush at his ranch in Crawford, Texas. Blair agreed to support regime change, but only if the UN route had been exhausted. Sir Richard Dearlove, the head of MI6, briefed the Prime Minister on his visit to Washington in July. He's reported as saying, Military action was now seen as inevitable. The intelligence and facts were being fixed around the policy. In our view, we thought that intelligence was used to justify a war which was a war of choice, of pure choice. But the intelligence was used to disguise that as a war of necessity. Tony Blair's chief of staff, Jonathan Powell, had warned that public opinion was fragile and the government now needed a Rolls-Royce information campaign. A last call went out for any further intelligence that could be presented in a dossier designed to be made public. With the publication deadline approaching, Three pieces of crucial new intelligence came into MI6. Uncertainty became certainty. Saddam Hussein was now judged to have active chemical and biological weapons. The most dramatic new intelligence was the warning that the WMD could be launched within 45 minutes. He has existing and active military plans for the use of chemical and biological weapons which could be activated within 45 minutes. So where did this intelligence come from? We've established that it is likely to have been conveyed by the exiled Iraqi opposition group, the INA, based in Jordan. Its founder headed a military committee with secret cells of dissident army officers inside Iraq. This was uh, all based on very uh, tight-knit uh, connections through relatives to avoid the security of, of Saddam. And we had cells and various units, and information used to be passed to us. Dr. Alawi's group was first told about the 45-minute warning when it was planning a coup in the mid-90s and feared Saddam would use WMD against defecting soldiers. The warning came from an Iraqi colonel called al-Daba, an artillery commander in Iraq's western desert. What was the intelligence? That they are ready to, to, to within 45 minutes, to hit any defection, any unit that will defect. With what? With chemical weapons. Did Colonel al-Daba say that he'd seen the weapons? No. In fact, Colonel Al-Daba simply assumed the sealed boxes delivered to his unit contained chemical or biological agents, and they'd just be short-range weapons for use on the battlefield. Was it clear from the intelligence from Colonel Al-Daba that the 45 minutes was referring to battlefield weapons? To me, it was clear, yes. 
The intelligence was then passed from Colonel Aldaba to his relative, Brigadier General Muhi, a senior officer in Saddam's military. We contacted him, but he didn't want to talk. General Muhi then passed it to the INA. When you got the information about the 45 minutes, yeah. did you pass that information on to MI6? I think it was passed by one of our officers. To MI6? Yes. By the time it got to London, the intelligence was third hand. Unusually, MI6 did not say the 45-minute warning came from an opposition group, albeit a trusted one, but simply said it came from a reliable source. CIA director George Tenet was less than flattering about Britain's 45-minute claim. Reportedly, he referred to it as that 45-minute shit. The 45 minutes intelligence prompted serious concern at the MOD's defense intelligence staff. Their experts thought it vague and ambiguous. It referred very generally to chemical and biological weapons, which immediately suggested that, that, that um, whoever was providing the material didn't have a detailed understanding. The first government inquiry into the use of intelligence was chaired by Lord Butler. He singled out the 45-minute warning as being one of the most misleading intelligence failings, since it implied Iraq was a serious and current threat to the UK. It was interpreted as referring to missiles that you could fire at uh, Cyprus, and that did make it sensational. Now, that misunderstanding, I think, was due to a bit of a sloppy bit of use of intelligence. Unusual, because for the most part, the intelligence was handled very professionally, but um, in this case, it was left vague. What's more, although MI6 knew that the 45-minute claim referred to short-range battlefield weapons and not long-range missiles, this critical distinction was never mentioned in their intelligence report or in the government's dossier. Indeed, the MI6 chief, Sir Richard Dearlove, admits he knew that it only referred to battlefield weapons. But MI6 never told the Prime Minister or ever mentioned it in the dossier. I think it was a serious uh, mission because it misled a lot of uh, people. So I think one can say that it was a serious uh, error in the uh, dossier. But there were still more errors to come. Just 12 days before the dossier was published, Sir Richard Dearlove took personal charge of the other two pieces of new intelligence and drove to Downing Street to brief the Prime Minister. For the first time, MI6 had a spy who claimed to have direct access to the production of chemical and biological agents. He became known as the new source on trial. Sir Richard called it a significant breakthrough. Although the source was not quoted in the dossier, the intelligence was seized upon as confirmation that Saddam had active WMD. It was an exciting event, last minute, I mean, rather like sort of stop press news in a newspaper. <laughs> and so people did act, I think, with undue haste. Giving evidence to the Chilcot inquiry, some MI6 officers were highly skeptical of the new source on trial. It was... Being torn off the teleprinter and rushed across to number 10 with a little more haste than was probably appropriate. Another said it was... Wishful thinking, which promised the crock of gold at the end of the rainbow. Why wasn't it shown to the Defence Intelligence staff who could have made a proper assessment of it? Because it was thought dangerous uh, that uh, here was a new source on trial and uh, if it was compromised in any way, the source might be lost. I found it quite difficult to believe that there could exist a single piece of intelligence um, in which there could be such great confidence 
And this made me suspicious about, uh, about it and about what was going on. I think it was a serious mistake that it wasn't shown to the analyst's intelligence, or, or, or always to be shown to the people who can analyse its uh, validity. Sir Richard Dillove also told Tony Blair of more dramatic new intelligence. It seemed to corroborate Curveball's claims of mobile biological labs. I was told, and specifically briefed, about these mobile production facilities for biological weapons. So this was an additional and new factor. The MI6 chief said one of their trusted spies, codenamed Red River, had heard that Iraq had developed biological fermenters to be carried on lorries or railway trucks. The problem was, it was hearsay. Red River was basing this on what he'd been told by someone else whom MI6 had never met. What's more, that someone else had never actually claimed the fermenters had any connection with biological weapons. This really didn't substantiate Curveball's information, but it was complementary to it. What this illustrates is that you must always subject those reports to the technical experts. We asked Sir Richard Dearlove to comment, but he said he could not ahead of the forthcoming Chilcot report. General Sir Mike Jackson was Britain's senior soldier when troops were sent to fight a war allegedly justified by this intelligence. What I do know is intelligence sources do not always tell the truth. What appeared to be gold in terms of intelligence turned out to be fool's gold because it looked like gold, but it wasn't. When the eagerly awaited dossier was finally published, the Prime Minister lost no time in telling Parliament that the intelligence case had been established beyond doubt. His weapons of mass destruction programme is active, detailed and growing. The trouble was that the intelligence was never that certain, as defence analysts felt at the time. We had not seen evidence that established that beyond doubt and that it concerned us. The weapons of mass destruction program is not shut down. It is up and running now. It was just guessing that there could be residual stocks and some resumption of activities. It concludes that Iraq has chemical and biological weapons, that Saddam has continued to produce them. There was a consistent effort to find intelligence that supported preconceived positions and desires. He has existing and active military plans for the use of chemical and biological weapons, which could be activated within 45 minutes. Now, that was a, a surprising um, statement uh, to us in the military. What was your reaction? Extremely surprised. We were really quite dismissive of that intelligence and thought that it was quite transparently weak. What was your reaction to the 45-minute claim? We haven't had such kind of information. The intelligence picture they paint is one accumulated over the last four years. It is extensive, detailed and authoritative. In fact, the original intelligence that was given to the Prime Minister was clearly qualified. It said, Intelligence remains limited, is sporadic and patchy. The crucial qualifications to the intelligence were totally absent from the government's dossier in order to make a convincing case to the public and to Parliament. It seems the government wanted to leave little room for doubt. The qualifications should have been there because I think that in a sense, this was the mistake. The dossier led people to believe that because it was intelligence, it was uniquely worthy of belief. There was other intelligence from human and technical sources, eavesdropping and intercepts, but they painted a less alarming picture. Blair's critics have accused him of deliberately sexing up the dossier by omitting these qualifications and including flaky intelligence. Was Tony Blair a liar?
No, I don't believe he was a liar. I, I believe that uh, when he when he said uh, what he believed about uh, Saddam Hussein, he was speaking the truth. Uh, but I think um, because the qualifications on the evidence weren't uh, made clear, I think he oversold the case. But that's the reason why there are so many people today who feel outraged still today that they were misled by the Prime Minister. Yes, but I think one could say in the Prime Minister's defence that he'd misled himself. He, 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 and indeed the intelligence community had misled themselves. When the dossier was published, the invasion was just six months away. America's war machine was waiting for the signal to go. And now the Bush administration was determined to use curveball to clinch the case for war. The CIA was more anxious than ever to meet him face to face. At a chic Washington restaurant, Tyler Drumheller pressed his contact in German intelligence for access to Curveball. He and I were good friends, so we had a lot to talk about. And at the end, I said, oh, by the way, they asked me to ask you about this Curveball case. Is there any way they can get access to him because it's really important? And he said, don't ask. They're not going to give you access to him. And I said, oh, OK. And he said, look, because this is a source we don't have any corroboration for it. He said, and I'll tell you off the record that I think personally, he says, I, I dealt with this case, I believe personally that he's, he may be a fabricator. The CIA director says Drumheller failed to pass this and other warnings on. Just before Christmas 2002, the head of German intelligence, August Hanning, sent a personal cable to CIA director George Tenet, warning about the intelligence from Curveball. It is not confirmed. Please be cautious to use this kind of not confirmed information. And of course he was a single source. He was a single source, we told them. Did you do enough to warn the Americans, to warn the CIA about Curveball? Yeah, but they, they were not in a state of, uh, or in a mindset to be warned. The CIA says Hanning's cable never left Drumheller's office. George Tennant says he never got that yeah. cable from the head of the but BND. He but he says he didn't. Well, he did. He I tell you, he did. You're suggesting he's So you have to put my word against George Tennant. That's a, oh, I won't say he lied, because I don't, but I just say I know George Tennant's How do you know cable. George Tennant? Because I sent it to him. We sent it to him. Well, apparently there are other senior officers uh, who don't have any specific recollection of these 11th hour warnings that came from Tyler Drumheller. I have complete faith in the integrity, both of George Tennant and of John McLaughlin, his deputy. George Tennant says that he never got your cable. It was uh, addressed to him personally himself, to, uh, to him. I, I have no explanation for it. Do you believe George Tennant? I've always believed that my comics. By the turn of the year, no one in the White House or Downing Street doubted that war was imminent. I do not believe the issue of WMD was the sole reason to go to war. Um, it was that strategic dimension. Uh, and uh, without doubt, um, the, the ideological mood in Washington was of that way. Um, so would the war have happened anyway? I believe that the United States uh, were determined to uh, deal with the Saddam Hussein regime. Finally, there was to be one last piece of intelligence that could have stopped the war. Incredibly, the source was Iraq's head of intelligence, Tahir Habush al-Tikriti the jack of diamonds on America's notorious deck of cards. Three months before the war, an MI6 officer met Habush in Jordan. We understand that Habush told MI6 that Saddam had no active WMD, 
the same message as that conveyed by the Iraqi foreign minister only days before the British dossier was published. But it wasn't what London or Washington wanted to hear. Bush and the others, they dismissed them apparently out of hand because they thought they were, it was propaganda or whatever, it didn't fit their, the mold. Whereas Kirkwall, because it did fit exactly into the story, they accepted without any validation at all. Did you get information about the meeting between the MI6 Secret Intelligence Service and Habush in Jordan? Was that part of the paperwork that you got from SIS? We discovered it was part of the uh, paperwork that uh, we got. You say you discovered after the event? After the event, yeah. Why wasn't it discovered when you, when you and your colleagues and staff went through all the documentation you got from SIS? Well, I, I can't uh, explain that. This was something which um, I think our review did miss. But um, when we asked about it, uh, we were told that uh, it wasn't a very significant fact because SIS um, discounted it as uh, something designed by Saddam to mislead. What's more, Lord Butler's inquiry never even knew about the Iraqi foreign minister, the man in the new suit. Were you aware that the CIA had recruited as a source Iraq's foreign minister? No. One would have thought that you would have been informed of that. Well, if SIS was aware of it, uh, we should have been informed. It's possible that if MI6 and the CIA had been able to convince Blair and Bush of the validity of the intelligence they were getting from their two most highly placed sources, Iraq's foreign minister and Iraq's head of intelligence, then Britain and America might not have gone to war. But by this time, the die had probably been cast. The month before the invasion, despite the growing doubts, Curveball was about to be revealed to the world. The US Secretary of State, Colin Powell, prepared to make a landmark speech to the United Nations. Tyler Drumheller says he was sent the draft for vetting. There was a whole bunch of stuff on Curveball in there. I called my immediate boss, the Deputy Director of Operations, and he said, well, you better check this with John McLaughlin, who was the Deputy Director of the agency at the time. And I said, look, there's a problem with this. We shouldn't use this. this and, there, and I said, there's paragraphs of this uh, from Kerpo all through this speech. Mr. McLaughlin, again, like Mr. Tennant, says he's got no recollection of you telling him this. I know. Well, it didn't happen. It did. So. Well, somebody's not telling the truth, are they? Either you... I'm telling the truth. The night before the speech, Colin Powell and George Tennant were closeted in a hotel room in New York with their top aides. I sat with Director Tennant. My recollection is until about 2 a.m. or later. The atmosphere was serious. We knew this was profound, and we also knew we had to get it not just right, but perfect. Did Colin Powell question the intelligence that he was being given on WMD before he made his presentation? The Secretary of State not only questioned the intelligence, he questioned it intensely. He was personally involved. He understood the significance of this. I was home, my daughter answered the phone, and she said, oh, Dad, it's Mr. Tennant. And so I got on, it was George. He was calling from the UN. He said, well, we're really tired. We've been up for, for 72 hours. He wanted to get the telephone number for uh, someone in, in SIS. And I, before he hung up, I said, boss, I said, that German reporting, we exited out of the report. I said, make sure they don't use that. I said, there's a lot of problems with that German reporting. And he said, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. We got it, we got it all under control. <laughs> And George Tennant uh, says he has no recollection of your saying that to him. Yeah, I do. I mean, this, you'll have, one of us is not telling the whole truth, so I'm quite comfortable with what I have to say. Every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. I will cite some examples. Ironically, the person presiding over the UN session was Joska Fischer, the German foreign minister. He knew there was a big question mark hanging over curveball. Colin Powell said, these are facts. And we knew that the real fact is that neither Colin Powell nor we could prove that these are facts. 
It might be true, it might not be true. The source was an eyewitness, an Iraqi chemical engineer who supervised one of these facilities. He actually was present during biological agent production runs. Colin Powell said that he, that's you, the source, was present during the biological production runs. Were you present no. then? He was also at the site when an accident occurred in 1998. 12 technicians died from exposure to biological agents. Were you present on site no. when an accident occurred? No. We have first-hand descriptions of biological weapons factories on wheels and on rails. You say you provided diagrams yes. of the mobile biological Oops. trucks. Yes. You were making that up. Yes. And also, you made a model, you constructed a model yes. of these trucks. Yes. Again, you made that up. Yes. We have diagrammed what our sources report. Turn on the TV in my office, and he's going through, and as he's going through, it's the curveball stuff. I said, wait a second. That... Not, not just going through the curveball stuff. He's got graphics. He's got pictures. Of and... mobile yes. trailers with biological. Which, and giving the impression that this was somehow drawn from things that curveball said. None of it was true. All of it was lies. Yes. His eyewitness account of these mobile production facilities has been corroborated by other sources. An Iraqi major who defected confirmed that Iraq has mobile biological research laboratories. That was the second spy who fooled the world, Major Mohammed Harith. Seven. But inexplicably, no one had told Colin Powell that Harith had been formally dismissed as a fabricator nine months before. It was curveball. That's it. The Iraq war was based on lies. Gradually, the lies were revealed. Three days after Colin Powell's presentation, UN inspectors, now finally back in Iraq, visited the site where Curveball said he'd seen the mobile biological laboratories. What did you find? A lot of, a lot of seed, a lot of corn, uh, a lot of, a lot of nothing. We have first-hand descriptions of biological weapons factories on wheels and on rails. The building was dusty, extremely dusty. And there were some old hulks of equipment that I didn't recognize it. I don't think any of them ever could be used for biological production. And the six foot wall that blocked the entrance to the warehouse was still there. I don't know when the last time a human was in that building, but I was the first in a long time. <laughs> This was clearly not in use for a long time and clearly not a biological weapons production facility. So at that point, I was very disappointed. As doubts were growing about the strength of the intelligence case, a million demonstrators marched through London to express their opposition to the imminent invasion. Tony Blair remained adamant. This is not the time to falter. This is the time for this house, not just this government or indeed this prime minister, but for this house to give a lead, to show that we will stand up for what we know to be right. The following night, the war began. In a matter of weeks, Saddam's regime was toppled. After the war was over and the fall of Saddam, MI6 and the CIA traverse the Middle East, hoping to track down their precious agents. They hope to confirm that they were reliable sources and find out where the elusive WMD were hidden. There were no WMD and no substance to the corroborating sources on which MI6 had relied. The two key pieces of last-minute intelligence that the MI6 chief had personally conveyed to Tony Blair were withdrawn. The new source on trial was deemed to be unreliable. Red River was given a lie detector test and failed. And what's more, the controversial 45-minute claim 
was withdrawn. There was even one report that MI6 traced a source back to a small Jordanian town. He was a taxi driver who said he'd overheard Iraqi generals talking about WMD in the back of his cab. It seemed to epitomize how flaky so much of the intelligence was. It was a year after the invasion before the CIA finally got to meet Curveball. An MI6 officer was present too. Curveball was shown a satellite photo of the site where he'd worked. It bore no relation to how he'd described it. Curveball said, well, that's been doctored. And he said, no, it hasn't. It hasn't been doctored. And he said, Curveball said, I think I've said everything I'm going to say. And then he just stopped talking. And then Curveball said to the Germans as he was leaving, I told you this was a mistake. That was the last thing he said to him. And so what was the view of the CIA officer who he did the He called me interview? on the phone. He called me on the secure phone right away and said, he said, this guy, he, he just admitted, he said he's fabricated. I, I, he said, I believe this is all made up. The CIA officially declared Curveball a fabricator. A week later, its director, George Tenet, resigned. Because of you, our nation is more secure. Because of you, the tyrant has fallen and Iraq is free. President Bush has said that the biggest regret of his presidency was the intelligence failure in Iraq. Ideological pressure from factions in the Bush administration had pushed the intelligence to the limit and beyond. The term cherry-picked has been the most consistent term. There was a consistent effort to find intelligence that supported preconceived positions. Very bad intelligence got to the leadership very quickly, but very other intelligence just didn't make it, just didn't get anywhere. When people look back on this time and look back on this conflict, I honestly believe they will see this as one of the defining moments of our century. That's great, thank you, sir. The real one. <laughs> Tony Blair has offered his deep regrets for the casualties the war caused. More than 4,000 British and American soldiers died and around 100,000 Iraqis. But Tony Blair has never apologized for the war itself. We requested an interview with Mr. Blair, but were told that he was too busy. There were ways in which people were misled or misled themselves at all stages. However, I do believe that uh, these were, as it were, honest mistakes, um, where not only the British intelligence community, but um, intelligence communities all over the world were brought themselves to a conclusion that turned out to be false. But the body that probably feels most misled of all is the British public. Yes, I think they're, they're, they've got uh, every reason to uh, think that. Ten years on from the invasion of Iraq, we're still living with the legacy of the spies who fooled the world. The fact is that we went to war in Iraq on a lie, and that lie was your lie. Yes. <laughs>